everybody. So for the next half an hour, we're going to be looking at home buying, starting off with the stages that you go through to buy a home, then how to prepare financially by looking at budgeting and improving your credit score. Then we're going to look at the best way to save for a deposit and what some of those help to buy schemes are. And then the other fees involved in buying a house and how much they're likely to be. Then we'll finish off with different types of mortgage um, and Q&A. Um, I've also put together a slide of useful resources that I'll show you at the end that you'll be able to take away. Uh, just a quick reminder before we start that the webinar is providing information only today, not advice. I'm just aiming to give you the tools and the knowledge to help you make your own decisions about home buying. Um, also, Better With Money is totally independent. We've got no products to sell and we're not in any way associated with any of the companies or the websites that I'll be mentioning today. So let's start off then with a few set stats to set the context um, and according to the money charity, last year, the average house price was just over £280,000 throughout the UK. The average first time home buyer was aged 33 and paid a deposit of £61,000. And the average house price for the first time home buyer was £245,000. And that had increased by about 10% since the year before, which is roughly in line with what inflation was doing. Now, of those people that applied for mortgages last year, more than half managed to borrow money on a mortgage that was more than three times their annual income. On this slide, excuse me, I've just put um, together a, a useful table that I saw from the money charity. It was in their February statistics. And it shows the average house price by area and also how much that price for a first time house has increased over time. And this is really just as a reference point for you to go back to. Um, last year, the lowest house prices were in Northern Ireland um, and the highest, as you'd expect, in London, a whopping £543,000 for the average house in London. OK, so let's start by looking at the process that you go through when buying a house in England and Wales. Now, the first stage that you should do before you even start looking at houses is to work out how much you can afford. Now, there are calculators online that are going to give you an indication. Um, we've got a mortgage affordability calculator on the Best With Money website that you're welcome to use. Um, and this is really going to give you a, an indication of what you can have. But the best thing to do is to approach a recommended mortgage broker who knows the market and knows what providers are likely to lend to you. So when you go to a mortgage broker, they'll ask you for details such as your salary, your last three months bank statements and the amount of deposit that you've saved all to work out what you can afford. They'll look at the mortgages available in the market and then they'll stress test your finances to see if you could still pay that mortgage on a monthly basis if there was a sudden change that might affect things like a, a rise in interest rates, uh, which we actually saw nine times last year. Now, if you don't have friends or family that can recommend a mortgage broker, um, take a look at unbiased.co.uk. I'll be putting the details up later. Most mortgage brokers um, you know, as long as they're qualified, they will only charge you a fee if they actually go ahead and arrange that mortgage for you. They don't normally charge you for that initial discussion. And what the mortgage broker will do is they will get a mortgage in principle for you based on your circumstances, which says how much you can borrow based on all of that information that they've gathered. And that is what's going to give you a guide, that mortgage in principle, as to which houses you can start looking at based on their price. The next step is to find your property. Now, you could do this by looking in your local estate agents. Nowadays, lots of people look online from the comfort of their own sofa. They look at things like Rightmove, Zoopla or On The Market. Now, if you find something that you like, then you arrange that viewing with the agent, although some agents do virtual tours as well now. And once you've found that property you like, then you can put in an offer. Now, that offer can be lower than the asking price, but the seller is well within their rights to turn that down and only to take offers which are at least what they are looking for. But just like anything, when it comes to finances, it's well worth a go at haggling to get that reduction. Now, if your offer is accepted, then you'll need to arrange a solicitor. And what they'll do is all the searches on the property, such as making sure that house isn't in a flood area or on a hazardous site. And they'll also liaise with the seller's solicitors to make sure that you get the contracts done. 
Now, your mortgage company, so the company lending you the money, is going to ask for a survey to be done on the house because they want to make sure that that house is worth what you're paying for it. And if there's any problems that come back, let's say, for example, it says there's a leaking roof or it's got damp, you can go back to the sellers at that stage and renegotiate the price. But assuming there's no problems, the offer, you know, the offer and the mortgage are finalised and those contracts will then be drawn up. Now, once the contracts are agreed, you exchange. And that is the point that the deal becomes legally binding. And then at that point of exchange, you normally pay about 10% of the house purchase price um, and your solicitors will arrange that. At that point, once you've exchanged, you'll also arrange a completion date. For most people, that completion date is around two weeks later, just to give you time to arrange removals and all the necessaries. Um, and once completion takes place, then the remaining money is paid over and the keys become yours. Um, and your solicitor's role is to liaise with the mortgage company just to make sure that the funds are released at the right time. Now, that whole home buying uh, process can take anywhere from about three months to a year on average. So it's really going to depend on how long it takes you to get that mortgage agreed, how long it takes you to find that house, um, and also the time taken to agree the contracts and to get the paperwork signed. Now, this home buying process does differ in Northern Ireland and Scotland. You know, a small example is that in Scotland, you have to put in blind bids on the property as to how much you're willing to pay for it. So please do look at the gov.scot um, website and the NI Direct website, which I'm going to be putting up in a moment, um, just so that you can get the process there. There's also a great section on the Money Helper website all around buying homes in all the different countries, and that's well worth a look as well. So let's go back then to that first part of the process, which is affordability. And how can you show the mortgage lender that you can afford that mortgage payment for, for the house that you want? So the best thing to do is to make sure you're keeping to a budget in the months running up to that application. That's really important. So that means getting a handle on what income you've got going coming in, what spending you've got going out, because you need to make sure on that run up to application that you're spending less than you earn. Now, we've got some monthly and annual planners on the Better With Money website that you're very welcome to use. We've also got interactive budget planners as well. But as you're going through that budgeting process, try and be really honest with yourself. Are there any places that you could definitely cut back and save money? Um, nowadays, when I talk to people, that's often things like food deliveries. That's a big part of overspend things like delivery, just eat, but also subscriptions as well for TV and music. You know, are there any you could cancel? On average in the UK, we have three subscriptions per person. So just cutting back on one might be able to save you £120 a year. And any reduced spending is only going to increase your chances of getting a mortgage. The other thing to do is to avoid taking on any debt, things like overdrafts, credit cards or loans on the run up to applying for that mortgage, uh, specifically in the last six months, because that lender is going to want to see that you can manage your finances on your income and that you haven't got too much recent credit in addition to the mortgage that you're taking on. So ultimately, your bank statements and your pay slips need to prove that you can afford to pay that mortgage month on month, even if interest rates rise or if costs increase. So getting your budget in order is absolutely essential to de demonstrate that to your mortgage lender. The next thing to do in the months before applying for a mortgage is to check your credit score and work on improving it. Because when you apply for a mortgage, lenders are going to run a credit check on you. They're going to be looking at your financial history, looking at all of your accounts over the last six years, because they're looking to see, is this person a responsible borrower? And they want to make sure you haven't missed any repayments on credit cards or loans, because if you have, that might suggest you'll do exactly the same on your mortgage and you're less likely to be approved. Now, your credit report is available through three apps, ones like Experian, Credit Score, um, Credit Karma, just like I've shown here on the right hand side. But whichever app you use, register for free online and then it will take you to your score. Now, each service, depending on which app you go for, has got a slightly different scoring range. But actually, the important thing is which category do you fall into? Is your credit score excellent? Is it good? Is it fair? Or does it need improving? 
Now you'll find that you have a better uh, or chance of getting a good credit score if you are using a credit card regularly and you're paying it off in full each month by the due date. Also, use less than 25% of your overall credit limit um, and don't take on too much credit, as I said, in a short amount of time, particularly on that run up to applying for that mortgage. Because what you're trying to do, you're just trying to build up a history of responsible borrowing so that your credit score goes up. The other thing to do is just make sure that all of your financial accounts are held at the same address and that you're registered to vote at that address because mortgage lenders will use that information to verify your identity. If you've got bank accounts at different addresses, you know, your own uni address, your parents address, the house you now rent, that can be reason enough that the mortgage gets declined. So really tighten up on, on your credit score and your, and your credit history. Basically, the higher your credit score, the more chance you're going to have of being accepted for that mortgage and the better the rates are likely to be. Now, the other thing the mortgage provider will be looking at is whether you've got a deposit to put down on that house um, so that you don't have to borrow the full amount. And the minimum you're going to need is a 5% five de five deposit of that house price. But the simple rule for deposits is that the more money you can put down on a house, the more chance you're going to have of getting that mortgage um, and the lower the interest rate on that mortgage is likely to be, which is better because it means your monthly repayments will be lower. Now, you tend to get the best mortgage offers with the lowest interest rates if you borrow 60 percent or less of your total house price and how much you borrow versus the price of the house is known as the loan to value. So if you put down a 20% uh, deposit and you borrow 80%, you have a loan to value of 80%. So where do you save that deposit? Well, one of the most tax efficient ways to save money is through an investment savings account or an ISA as it's known. And you can save up to £20,000 a year into an ISA and you don't get taxed on any returns and you can take the money out of an ISA tax-free. Now that ISA can be cash, works just like a bank account, or you can have an investment ISA, which is where you put your money into stocks and shares for more growth over that longer term. Or you can have a combination of the both. But the one I really wanted to touch on today is specifically for buying your first home. And that is known as the Lifetime ISA. And the Lifetime ISA is a government initiative that's designed to help you to get onto that housing ladder more quickly. Now, to open a Lifetime ISA, you must be aged 18 to 39. You can pay up to £4,000 a year into it out of your overall £20,000 ISA limit. And you can pay that £4,000 into a, a lifetime ISA either as a lump sum or regular savings or as and when you can. But the real added benefit of the lifetime ISA is that you get a 25% bonus on the, on the payment that you put in. So if you put in the maximum of £4,000, the government will add £1,000 and you can continue to save into that lifetime ISA putting £4,000 a year in up until the age of 50. Now, once you've held that account for at least one year, then you can use that money that's been saved up plus that uh, bonus from the government. And you can use that as a deposit on your first home, provided that home isn't worth more than 450,000. So if you think you're gonna want a lifetime ISA, it is worth opening one sooner rather than later with just a pound, you can get that clock ticking. You can always add funds to it later. Now, if you do want an ISA or a lifetime ISA, most of the major banks will offer these, but often their fees are higher than some of the app based online providers out there. So just like any other investments, you need to make sure that the fees you're paying for having an ISA um, is not going to outweigh the interest or the investment returns that you're getting. So I would definitely recommend that you look at Money Saving Expert website or The Witch magazine because they, they do fantastic rundowns of the best ISA providers in the market. The other thing you might want to do is familiarise yourself with the government help to buy initiatives. Um, these are really introduced to help first time buyers with small deposits get on the housing ladder. Now, there are different schemes in each of the different countries. Um, so I put the website addresses for each of the countries um, that will outline those government schemes at the bottom of the slide. But I'm just going to touch on three of the help to buy initiatives that are most popular in England at the moment. 
The first one is the Mortgage Guarantee Scheme. This is available until December this year. With this, you pay a 5% deposit. You can borrow the remaining 95% from the mortgage lender, and then you pay them back at the agreed mortgage rate over an agreed period of time. So that's just like a normal mortgage. But the mortgage lender has the added advantage that this mortgage is government backed. So if for any reason you don't keep up on those mortgage repayments, the government will cover a large proportion of any losses that the, that the mortgage company might suffer. So this scheme, the mortgage guarantee scheme, was put in place to encourage more mortgage lenders to offer 95% mortgages. But there are a few rules that will apply. It has to be for your main home. The purchase price must be less than 600,000 and you must have that at least 5% deposit and no more than 9%. You'll also just have to go through the lender's normal mortgage affordability criteria. The second one is shared ownership. This allows you to buy a share of a house from a housing association or house builder and then you continue to rent the remainder of the share of the house from them, and that can keep costs affordable. Now, this scheme is specifically for non-homeowners that earn less than £80,000 or £90,000 if you're in London. And you will, again, need at least a 5% deposit and be able to pay for all the costs. Later on, as you go on, you can buy a bigger share of the house if you can afford to do so. The last one is rent to buy. This is only available in England at the moment, and it's typically offered by housing associations. So the scheme offers working households the chance to rent a new build home um, at a rent that's about 80% of the market rate. And then that provides that renter with the opportunity to save for deposit over time in order to buy the home. And at the end of the initial period, the tenant will be offered the chance to buy that home either outright or on that shared ownership uh, type terms. If you require more time to save for a deposit, the Housing Association can extend those terms and they must do so for at least five years. So if you want the full range of schemes, please take a look at the website that's applicable to the country that you're in. But remember, if you are going to buy a house, um, you'll not only need the deposit, but you'll need to save for the other fees as well. So I just thought I'd run through them here. The first one is a mortgage arrangement fee, and that is charged by your mortgage lender. That does vary from lender to lender. It typically ranges from about £500 to £2,000. Now, you can pay that in cash or you can add that to your mortgage amount that you're borrowing. It's entirely up to you. The next one is a valuation fee. Um, your mortgage lender will require a valuation of the property for their security because they want to make sure that if they're going to lend you all that money, that your house is worth it. Sometimes the valuation fee is included in the cost of the mortgage, but if not, you will have to pay that at the time that the valuation is carried out. You're also recommended to have a survey carried out on your house just to make sure that it's structurally sound, that there's no problems, things like rising damp or water pipe issues, because any pipes on your land are going to be your responsibility to fix. So this survey is really for your own peace of mind, just to make sure you've got a good quality property. It can be anywhere between kind of £400 and again, £1,500. Then there are the legal fees. When you buy a house, you should appoint a conveyance or a solicitor who will carry out the legal work because they're going to need to register you as the new owner of that property. Now, you can choose a solicitor yourself or the mortgage company might recommend one, but it's up to you who you choose. I mean, personally, whenever I've moved house, I've tended to use a licensed conveyancer because they specialise in this work. They tend to be a little bit cheaper um, than solicitors, and because they do this work day in, day out, I find they get the job done more quickly. Um, legal fees are typically around half a percent of the purchase price. Um, and at the point of completion, there's a government tax that you have to pay. Um, in England and Northern Ireland, it's called stamp duty. In Scotland, it's land and buildings transaction tax. And in Wales, it's called land transaction tax. Now, all three of these tax systems will charge you somewhere between 0 and 12% of the purchase price, depending on how much you're paying for that and whether you're a first time buyer. Now, if you want to find out what that stamp duty or that land transaction tax is going to be, you can go onto the Better With Money website. That's the first website address at the bottom there um, and put in uh, the details and it will tell you what that stamp duty is likely to be.
Um, but also don't forget that you're going to have moving fees as well. They could be up as much as £1,500, depending on how much uh, furniture you've got to move. Um, and you're also going to need house and contents insurance. And the mortgage company are likely to want you to have life assurance so that if anything were to happen to you, it would pay off the mortgage. And how much these insurances are going to cost you is going to depend on the value of your house and the contents that you want to cover. Um, if you want to read more about the cost of moving house, Right Move have got some brilliant articles, so I've put their website address at the bottom. So to finish off today, I just want to run you through the different types of mortgages available. And just like any loan, the mortgage company will lend you the money to buy the house, and then you pay that money back with interest over an agreed period of time. Um, you can apply for a mortgage by yourself or you can apply jointly. And if you apply jointly, then both of your finances will be taken into account when looking at affordability. Now, traditionally, home buyers have tended to go for mortgages over a 25 year term, but nowadays more and more people are extending their mortgage terms over 35 or even 40 years, because the longer you spread it out, the more affordable it becomes. But remember, the longer the period, the more interest you'll pay back overall. You'll also have the choice as to whether the mortgage is repayment or interest only. Now, with a repayment mortgage, that means the repayments you're paying back every month are gradually going to pay back that original amount that you borrowed, plus any interest. But if you choose interest only, the amount you're paying back is just the interest. It's not the original amount that, you, that you've borrowed in the first term. So most lenders are going to want proof that you've got a way of repaying that amount borrowed at the end of the mortgage term. And for that reason, it's less popular and mortgage lenders try to steer you away from those interest only. But let's look at these mortgage types. So the first one's a fixed rate mortgage. That's where the mortgage company fixes the interest you're paying for a period of time, normally two, five or 10 years. And the advantage is that you've got peace of mind because you know how much your mortgage payment is going to be every month. But the downside is if interest rates go down, you still have to pay the same amount till the end of that fixed period. The second one's a tracker mortgage. So this is where the interest rate is usually the base rate, which at the moment in the UK is 4% plus a percentage above that, which has been set by the lender. So if your mortgage uh, is set at 1% above the base rate, um, if that base rate goes up or down, your tracker rate will move accordingly. Now, the downside here is that your mortgage payments could change every time there's a base rate review. That's about every six weeks at the moment throughout the year. And we've got our next, next base rate review tomorrow. Now with the, excuse me, with the standard variable rate, the mortgage lender sets the rate. It could go up or down at any time, as long as they give you a bit of notice. And mortgages that have got an initial period that are fixed for a while or they're on a tracker or a discount. Once you get to the end of that term, you typically trip into the standard variable rate. The upside of the SVR is that you're not tied in for a set period, so you've got flexibility to move to a different deal. Um, however, rates are normally higher on standard variable rates than they are on fixed rates and trackers. Now, a discounted variable rate is where you get a discount on that standard variable rate for a period of time. But that discounted rate, again, will move up and down in line with the lender's rates. And lastly, we've got the offset mortgage there. That's where you have your savings and your mortgage all in one account and your cash savings are used to offset against the mortgage interest that you've been charged. So do take a look at Right Move. Uh, they've got lots of information about the different types of mortgages. Um, and once you get to the end of your mortgage term, normally people will review their mortgages. So if you've got a, a fixed term for two years, at that point, just like insurances, you should look around the market, make sure that your mortgage is still appropriate for you and that you're getting the best deal. Some mortgages will allow you to overpay, but it is worth checking the terms and conditions of the mortgage just to make sure that it works for you. Now, on this slide, I've just put together some useful resources, everything from a glossary of uh, terms, which can be helpful from Money Supermarket, a house view and checklist to help you when you go and look at your dream property, all the way through to stamp duty calculators um, and some buyer guides as well.
Um, and lastly, I just want to say this webinar has been arranged by the ICU Ben Fund and Support Network today. So I've included their website and their contact details here um, and they're recording the webinar. So that will be added to their website so you can go back over them if needed. Thank you, Sarah. That's all from me. Good luck with your home buying in future. Um, and have we got any questions? That's great. Thank you very much. Some top quality content, as always. We do have a couple of questions. First of all, if I get a credit card to buy a small purchase, the example used here is a packet of crisps every month, then pay it off as soon as humanly possible, e.g. before waiting until the end of the month, is this a good way to improve my credit score? Um, it, as long as you are using credit and you are paying it off, um, you don't have to wait until the due date in order to pay it off. Um, however, I would suggest that maybe just a packet of crisps might not be enough uh, to be seen as a, a significant amount of, of credit. I mean, it doesn't have to be much. It might just be a, a tank of petrol or your weekly food shop. Um, but something that's around, I mean, the, the ideal is if you're borrowing about, let's say, 20 to 30 percent of your overall credit limit. So if you've got a thousand pound credit limit on your credit card, if you're spending regularly two to three hundred pounds a, a month on that, paying it off in full at the end of each month. So you're not even paying any interest. Um, and you do that for a period of six months, that would be kind of the ideal in order to start boosting your, your credit score. That's great. Thank you. And the next question, do you foresee the home value for ELISA increasing at any point with London prices of £450,000 property is a bit difficult? I couldn't agree more. And I really, really hope so. And I know there has been some lobbying to do that, because if you're anywhere else in the country, buying your first home for £450,000 is relatively achievable. If you do live in London with the average house price at well over 500, it's difficult. And that lifetime ISA is out of the realms. So um, I really hope they do. The fact that the help to buy schemes, they set a £600,000 limit could be a precursor to increase in the lifetime ISA, but unfortunately, I couldn't say for sure. That's great. And does the lifetime ISA only go towards the deposit or can it also cover fees? Um, it can. It can go towards the deposit. It can cover the fees. Um, the other thing you can do with it, let's say you started saving into a lifetime ISA and then the first property you did buy was over that 450. Um, you can leave that money there until you're 60 and use it to supplement your retirement income as well. And you can get it out uh, penalty free. That's great. And just a couple more because we've got quite a few questions. So we may have to address some of them in a document uh, with the recording. Uh, but the next one, if you've got a moment still, if I buy a house using a lifetime ISA as a first time buyer, can I then buy with a partner using a lifetime ISA as a first time buyer with me topping up the deposit? Um, sorry, I'm listed. Are they both first time buyers or is one is and one isn't? Uh, I get the impression that perhaps the situation is by one person buying as a first time buyer and then buying oh, obviously later on with a partner who is themselves a first time buyer, but the original person yeah. asking the question is no longer a first time buyer. Yeah, that makes sense. So, um, yes, if you used your uh, lifetime ISA on your first term time purchase and then you bought with a first time buyer for the second one, they could use their lifetime ISA because they are still a first time buyer, even if you uh, buy jointly. And if you are both first time buyers buying together for the first time, you can use both of your um, funds, but the house price is still limited at 450. That's great. And last one, and the rest will do in a document, if that's okay. Is overpaying, uh, let me start again, is overpaying a clever thing to do? Would it reduce the term or only interest part of the mortgage? OK, so whether you overpay or not, um, one is going to be down to affordability, but two, could that money work for you harder somewhere else? So let's say that you negotiated a mortgage at the moment and it had a 4% interest rate on it. Um, if you could put that money elsewhere, like let's say in a savings account and get 5% interest on it, then you're actually financially going to be better off putting that money in that savings account, getting that 5% interest, and then later down the line, taking that as a lump sum and paying off your more or paying an extra amount on your mortgage. But if you've got a 4% mortgage and you're only getting 1% on that money in the bank, 
then actually overpaying could be a financially savvy thing to do. When you overpay, um, yes, it will pay off the it will pay off the total amount more quickly, and it's up to you then whether you then reduce the term um, or whether you just uh, bring that payment down. It's entirely up. You could carry on paying the same amount each month and, and reduce the term, or you could keep the same term and lower your monthly payments. Hopefully, that was clear. <laughs> That's really great. Thank you, Sarah, for a really brilliant webinar and uh, lots of great content. Upcoming similar webinars that may be of interest to delegates today include Let's Talk Managing Debt, Financial First Steps and Switch On to Company Benefits. Those are all coming up in the next couple of months. So do make sure to book on some of those if any of those take your fancy. Thank you again, Sarah, and to all delegates for joining us today. As mentioned earlier, all questions that haven't been answered will be addressed in a document and uh, will be sent out with the recording. There will be a recording available. I can see a couple of people asking about that, but that will be most likely in a few days. Thank you, everyone, for joining us and spending your time with us. We hope to see you soon. Uh, thank you and see you next time.